Good morning to you. Let's stand and worship this morning. Give him praise. Praise him.
praise this morning. We give him all the glory. We celebrate the name of Christ, King of kings, Lord of lords. If God is for us, who can be against us? Amen. sing. Um, it is a good morning indeed. Uh, we are blessed to be in God's house this morning and I just want to welcome you here if you're a first time guest. Um, this morning, Brother Kyle's not here. Praise God. Amen. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. We're blessed this morning to have Brother Don Mathis come and bring us the word. And so with that, let's just go to the Lord in prayer uh, and let's continue on in worshiping this morning through song. Gracious Heavenly Father, God, we thank you so much for this wonderful day, this glorious day that you've given us. Lord, if nothing else, Lord, we ask that you would open up our hearts so that we would truly worship you this morning. Lord, I lift up Brother Don Mathis to us, Lord, we just ask that you would bless him and speak through him as he gives us the word this morning. Be with Brother Dane and those who are singing and those who are in the sound booth. Lord, help us to worship and song as well. Lord, we thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Romans 5.20 says this. God's law was given so that all people could see how sinful they were. But as people sinned more and more, God's wonderful grace became more abundant. So just as sin ruled over all people and brought them to death, now God's wonderful grace rules instead. 
giving us right standing with God and resulting in eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Our sins, folks, are many, 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 but His grace is more. Amen. Praise the Lord. Can you hit that first slide and get that background going? Thank you. Let's stand. Praise the Lord. His mercy is more. Sin they are men, his mercy is more. One love could remember the wrongs we have done. A mission on knowing he does not bless us. Thrown into a sea without bond. His blood was the payment, his life was the cost. We stood neath a debt we could never afford. Our sins, they are many, his mercy is more. Praise the Lord, his mercy is more. He's a merciful God, slow to anger, ready to forgive if we will return to Him. Christ the Son, Jesus our Savior. I believe in God our Father. I believe in Christ. 
Christ the Son, I believe in the Holy Spirit, our God is three in one. I believe in the resurrection, that we will rise again, for I believe in the name of Jesus. I judge and our defender, some foot and crucified. Forgiveness is in you. Descended into darkness, you rose in glorious light. Forever seated I. I believe in God our Father. I believe in Christ the Son. I believe in the Holy Spirit. I've got Jesus. 
Jesus. We believe, Lord. We confess with our hearts, Lord, you, Jesus, as Lord today. Lord, we repent of our sin and we turn to you, God, and ask that you would change our hearts today through your spoken word that Brother Don's going to bring in just a moment. I pray that you would fill his word with your spirit, God, and that it would move in and out of these people, Lord, and myself, Lord, that we would be changed and made better. God, I pray that you would empower us for new life, Lord, that you would quicken our spirits and draw us to you. And I pray, God, that you would be glorified and magnified above all else. We give you thanks for the blood, Jesus, that you shed for us. We give you thanks for your grace, for your mercy, for the gift and the hope of the resurrection, Lord, someday when we will live eternally with you, our God, our Father. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Amen, amen. I believe everything in that last song and the other songs as well. And Brother Dane, I'm glad that you're here permanently. And Cody, I don't know whether I'm glad you're leaving or not. I don't think so. But when Brother Kyle asked me to preach on the 1st of August so he could preach at his beloved Nelson Creek Baptist Church in Muhlenberg County, and I've preached there many times. That's a great, great church. Has a great heritage. He and his brother and others that they've sent out to preach the word from that church, and he just really, really felt like he wanted and needed to be there today. And then I found out that Cody and Emily were leaving today. And I thought, what a horrible time for me to be at Southside. But I'm glad to be here in spite of that. And you know, we teach them and preach to them that they ought to follow the leadership of the Lord. And sometimes we don't like the result of that, but uh, we do trust the Lord and His leadership. And, and I know that for the rest of their ministries, they will be like Miss Sharon and me, that we look back on the time that we had at Southside Baptist Church. And after all these years, it's amazing that I still feel very much at home when I'm at Southside Baptist Church. Now, if you're new to here, let me just share a little bit that all these other folks will know. The search committee from Southside came to hear me at the Green River Baptist Church on the 31st of March. Now, Sharon and I had gotten married the Sunday before, March the 24th, and they showed up the week after our wedding from Southside. I preached here for the first time on April the 7th. The church called me as pastor on April the 14th. And we wound up here on May the 26th. Now consider we got married March the 24th. We got to Princeton at Southside Baptist Church on May the 26th. And obviously, in the early years of our married life, and our two children were born here, that you and this town became very much a people of our heart. I often say I've had the privilege of pastoring five good churches and two great churches. Now, don't ask me which one I love the most, Central Corbin or Southside Princeton. They're one and one A, and I won't tell you in which order they go. It depends on which end of the state I'm in at the time, okay? And when I think of one, I think of the other because they tied together. So I walked back in the Hatler building this morning when I first got here and looked on the image of H.G.M. Hattler, who was the lead in founding Southside Baptist Church and was one of my predecessors as pastor of Central Baptist Corbin. And then J. Bill Jones, longtime pastor of First Baptist here in Princeton, interim pastor at Southside, was also my, one of my beloved predecessors at Central Baptist Corbin. So the two in my mind, and I always go by either church and make sure my picture is still on the wall. <laughs> And I appreciate seeing that this morning. And Cody, we do pray for your blessing upon you and Emily as you go. I met Cody when he was 11 years of age. He said later that he was not nearly as nervous meeting Emily's mother and father as he was walking into my house with Emily. If I'd have known he'd wanted to marry her, I would have blotted him out when he was 11 years old. <laughs> First Baptist Church, Mount Orb, Ohio. Emily and her twin sister, Jennifer, they've been a part of our lives as their older sister, Jessica, all of their lives. Their father 
my associate pastor in three different ministries. Obviously, I took him from one place to another because he did all the work so I could preach. And so they've been a part of our lives, and when they graduated college, one of them graduated number two, large graduating class, one of them graduated number two, and one number three academically in their graduating class. Why one of them one number one, I don't know. But number two and number three, they graduated from college and got jobs to teach in Warren County. And Sharon and I said to them, we know you don't have any money. Nobody graduates from college with any money, you usually got debts. Why don't you live with us a while, and then when you accumulate a little money, then you can get an apartment. So they lived with us for six months, and we had a good time with them. I mean, we've even been known to eat donuts for dinner. I mean, you know, whatever we thought of, we pretty much did. Anyway, you've been a blessing to them. I'll say that in their behalf. You have been a blessing to them, and you will pray for them in the future as you have in the present and in the past. Let me just ramble just a little bit more, and I didn't come to ramble. I came to preach. You've asked about our children. We spent this last week, as we have for nine straight years, in St. Simons Island, Georgia. The nine of us, Donnie and Laura Beth and their families, and we left yesterday still liking one another fairly well. Now, don't, 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 don't look at me strange because you've got families too, and you know what I mean by that. Uh, Laura Beth lives on the Kentucky River, just looking down at the Kentucky River between Richmond and Lexington, Kentucky. And she is in, hum in Human Resources with Sherwin-Williams Paint. So when you paint, remember that. That puts food on my granddaughter's table. And, uh, she, and her husband is, uh, he's got a fancy title, but he's a, actually a diesel fuel salesman. And they, the Lord is blessing them. And Donnie, by the way, Donnie's second grade teacher is here this morning. Donnie and his wife Amber and their two children, and they, they have a son who's eight, Donnie Ray Mathis III. How about that? Donnie Ray Mathis III, and their youngest child, our beloved granddaughter, Hallie, is four years of age. And he teaches New Testament and Greek, hermeneutics, and other things that I can't pronounce at North Greenville University. And uh, he was born here. Laura Beth was born here. You are a blessing to our lives. Now turn with me in your Bible to Matthew chapter 16. I came to preach, not to ramble. Matthew chapter 16, and I want to talk about what's right with the church. Now the church is being bombarded politically, in the media, in the conversations at the various uh, coffee places, it's being bombarded today. And a lot of people want to be critics of the church. And the fact is that you can walk up and down the aisles of our churches and ask the question, what's wrong with our church? And you'll get a multitude of answers. But I want to tell you folks, there's a lot right about our churches. So I want to talk with us this morning about what's right with the church. I've talked about our ministry here at Southside. I have preached in I don't know how many churches, 30 years of pastor, uh, 12 years preaching about 38 to 40 revival meetings a year, six years in denominational ministry. I have preached in 111 of the 120 counties in Kentucky. I've preached in every county in West Virginia. I preached all across the South, in particular in evangelism, and I preach virtually every Sunday. I don't have an opening now until on into October, preaching different places right now. Every church I'm in, I find something I like about that church. The church is a miracle of God. I love the church. I love the church. Matthew chapter 16, Jesus talks about the church. If this is the first time in the New Testament where the word ecclesia, which is translated church, is used. This is the first time right here in Matthew chapter 16. It is used 115 different times in the New Testament, and about 96 of them we know specifically that it's talking about a local church like Southside Baptist Church. 
Uh, sometimes it talks about the church in general, that is, the saved of every generation and every age, but the ecclesia is the called out and the gathered together. Therefore, that church has not met yet. So in the practical sense, when we talk about the church, we're talking about the local congregation. Verse 13, Matthew 16, you found it. I'm going to be reading from the King James, and you'll find that on the screen, but for the sake of Mathesology, I'm going to change the these and the thous to you's and me's. Will that be okay? Other than that, I'm in the King James, just like I've preached from for 97 years now. Beginning at verse 13. When Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And they said, Some say that you are John the Baptist, and some Elijah, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He says unto them, The most important question ever asked, But whom say ye that I am? Who do you say that Jesus is? And Simon Peter answered and said, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed it unto you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I say also unto you that you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I will give unto you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatsoever you shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. And whatsoever you shall loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Then charged he his disciples that they should tell no man that he was Jesus the Christ. Now please understand that verse number 20 was a temporary prohibition. At this point in time, uh, Jesus was being surrounded by people who were saying, declare yourself to be the Messiah. Declare, declare yourself to be the Christ. Organize an army. Lead us against the Romans. And Jesus did not come to be that kind of Messiah. He came to be your Savior. So Jesus said, keep that quiet right now. But then he reverses that prohibition. And in Matthew chapter 28 and all over the New Testament. He reverses it, it, it and he says, now is the time, go everywhere, tell everybody that the Christ has come, that salvation is available now to whosoever will call upon the name of the Lord, the church. I want to talk about what's right with the church. Now I realize there's some people who have a difficult time saying anything good about anything. There were two guys who spent a great deal of time together. One of them was inevitably optimistic and the other one was invariably pessimistic. Well, the optimistic guy bought a new dog. He took it out to hunting duck, and duck came over, shot, gave the dog a command, and the dog got out of the boat, walked across the water, picked up the duck, and brought it back to the boat. Well, he couldn't believe his eyes. Shot again, gave the dog a command, dog got out of the boat, walked across the water, brought the duck back to the boat. Well, he couldn't hunt any longer, had to go get his pessimistic friend, show him this marvelous dog. Well, they went out in a pressed out in the water together. In a few minutes, some ducks came over, shot simultaneously. Fortunately, they hit one of them. Gave the dog the command. Dog got out of the boat, walked across the water, picked up the duck, and brought it back to the boat. His friend didn't say anything. Shot again. Gave the dog the command. Dog got out of the boat, picked up the duck, brought it back to the boat. Well, his friend still didn't say anything. Shot again third time. Gave the dog the command. Dog got out of the boat, walked across the water, picked up the duck, brought it back to the boat. He said, you see anything unusual about my dog? He said, he can't swim a lick, can he? Now, that guy was a Baptist. I guarantee you he was a Baptist. We have such a unique way of digging through all that's right and good and positive to pounce on something that we think is negative or wrong and spread it all about. I've made up my mind. I'm going to spend my time talking about what's right with the church. Now, every now and then I backslide, but then I repent because I believe the church because Jesus said, upon this rock I will build my church. So this morning, I want to talk about what's right with the church. First of all, the church is right in its membership. Did you notice the conversation that's going there? They've come, going on there. They came to Caesarea Philippi, and I've been to Caesarea Philippi. 
I did not go to Israel until much later in my ministry, and I'm sorry about that. In fact, you offered to give me a trip to Israel when I was here, and I didn't think you'd get along without me long enough for me to go. How silly, how stupid. But my boy said, Daddy, you're going to go to Israel. I'm going to lead a tour to Israel, and when I lead that tour, you're going to go with me. Well, he called me. I said, okay, I'll go with you. I, you know, you make promises and you think, why did I say that? He called me and said, Dad, we're going to take a trip to Israel in May and you're going with us. I said, whoa, 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 wait a minute. I said, he told me the dates. I said, I'd have to cancel three revival meetings to go. He said, well, cancel them. I said, no, I'm not going to go. Well, you know how these women are. My daughter-in-law, Amber, and, and Sharon began to plot Next thing I knew, I was canceling meetings and going to Israel with, and, uh, with, with the group that Donnie led. And we, we were at Caesarea Philippi. I wish I could describe what it looks like, where Jesus must have been. We're not totally sure that's where he was, but where he must have been. It is a gigantic rock. Now, it's more than one rock, but they're pressed together so tightly it all looks like one rock across the bottom. And then in back of it, it's an amphitheater. In back of it, it's the same kind of a rock situation. I mean, that's where Jesus stood when he talked about the church, and he said, upon this rock, I will build my church. Now, it is true that Simon Peter's name means rock. But it's a different word from the word Jesus used. The name Peter is the Greek word petros. I hold a petros in my hand. I picked it up on the parking lot over the edge of it. My, you've got magnificent parking. Over the edge of it, I finally found a rock, and this is it. Now, I know where this rock came from. It probably came from this rock quarry out here on the Hopkinsville Road. Now, this is a small rock. I could throw it. I could probably hit Cody with it right now. It, I can throw it. It's pretty easy to handle. But you know that the rock, this rock came from somewhere else. It came from a bedrock. It came from a large, unshakable, unbreakable, unmovable rock. It was broken off of it. Now, if you take this rock, and you analyze it, it's a limestone rock, and find the bedrock off of which it came and analyze it, it is made up of the same minerals. It's the same, right? Well, when Jesus said, Thou art Peter, it's the word Petros, but it's a small rock. Then he says, But I'm on this rock. I will build my church, and it's a different word there. It is the word Petra, the bedrock. In other words, what, what Peter had said gave testimony that because of his faith in Jesus, he had received the nature of the bedrock. The church is not built on Simon Peter. It would be as unstable as mud like he was, but it's built upon Jesus. There is no greater miracle in this world than the fact that after all these years, there are churches all across the land because the church is built upon the bedrock and the church is Jesus' church. Therefore, I say the church is right in its membership. When I give the invitation this morning, if somebody walked down the aisle of Southside Baptist Church today on August the 1st and said to me, Brother Don, I've always been a good man. I've never done anything wrong. I've always been a good person. And I've come today to crown my achievements by joining Southside Baptist Church. Do you think I'm going to present him for membership? I'm just a guest preacher today. But do you think I'm going to present him for membership if he thinks he's joined the church because he's a good man? No, 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 never, never. Why? Because the church is to be made up of people who have realized I am a dirty, rotten, filthy sinner. Church on the organization I know of, you got to admit you're bad to join. I am a dirty, rotten, filthy sinner, or words to that effect. But I believe Jesus loves me. 
And I have asked him, or I'm asking him right now, to come into my life to forgive me of my sins, to take care of yesterday, today, and tomorrow. And I'm trusting him with all my heart as my Savior and Lord. I want to do what he told me to do and what he showed me to do. I want to follow him in believer's baptism and become a part of Southside Baptist Church. Am I going to present him for membership? Shake head this way. Absolutely. Absolutely. Therefore, the church is right in its membership. You say, well, Brother Don, I believe there are some people who are members of the church, their names on the roll, who are not really saved. I agree with you. I'm fearful of that. I'm fearful of that. But the genuine, true church member has made a profession of faith in Jesus as Lord. By the way, if you've not done that, why don't you do that this morning? I know I'm a guest preacher, but uh, I, I know these folks. And, they're not perfect, by the way. I've known some of them a long time, and they're not perfect. Neither am I. Neither are you. But that's not what saves us. The one who saves us is the one who is perfect, and because he took your sin upon himself and paid your sin debt on the cross, the minute you're willing to realize that you're a sinner and that you can't do anything to solve that problem that you have of sin, but you ask him to forgive you and save you and cleanse you and come into your life and take control. The very moment you do that, he'll do what the Bible promises he, that he will do for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And you do that and he'll save you today. If you've not already trusted him, you need to do that today. And then we'll talk about baptism, church membership, which is the first step of Christian obedience is to follow the Lord in believers' baptism, but the church is right in its membership. Secondly, the church is right in its management. Did you notice what it said there? Jesus said upon this rock I will build my church. Two letters, very small word, but it makes all the difference. It is Jesus's church. Therefore, the church is right in its management. I hear too many Baptists say, well, I got a right to vote my, my opinion. No, you don't. You have the right to vote what you believe is the leadership of the Holy Spirit. And sometimes that might be different. Because it is not. Well, there's a sense in which it's our church. And, and do you realize what a great privilege it is for you to be a part of the church and to participate in her decisions and her actions and her ministries? But ultimately, it is Jesus' church because he calls it his bride. And when we fall in love with him, then we fall in love with his church and we seek to follow his leadership in our decision-making and our actions because he is the manager of the church. And we're to line up with it, and we're to love it. He calls it his bride. Sir, do you ever get offended when somebody compliments your wife? No, neither do I, because that's a compliment to me. And the church is Jesus' bride. And love changes everything, doesn't it? I've talked a little bit about Donnie. Miss Sharon and I had concluded that Donnie would be a lifetime bachelor. At the age of almost 34, he had never married. My preacher boy, New Testament professor, seminary college, we just assumed Donnie would never get married. He seemed too busy with his studies and his teachings. Uh, he dated some, but never one quite measured up. They had to be beautiful, as smart as he was, and a University of Kentucky fan, and they were hard to find. So we just assumed he would be a lifetime bachelor. But on September the 24th, my family and I traveled all the way to Chatham, Alabama. Anybody here know where Chatham, Alabama is? I tell my daughter-in-law, nobody knows where Chatham, Alabama is. What happened? He fell in love. He fell in love. In fact, teaching one of his Greek classes, a young lady from Chatham, Alabama, felt called of God to do children's ministry, came to Louisville, Kentucky, walked in her very first class. I wouldn't advise teaching or taking a Greek class, first class you take, but she walked in a Greek class, and a handsome young professor, I'm telling the story, handsome young professor, single, never been married, 
Uh, they didn't date. Now, they'll emphasize that. They didn't, they didn't even become friends until about six months later. But anyway, Donnie fell in love. And I performed a lot of weddings, some of somebody here today. But that one was different. When I stood in front of that 33, almost 34-year-old young man, Donnie and Amber, and I asked a question, and he gave a two-word answer. Donnie, do you take Amber to be your lawful wedded wife? He said two words. I do. Did that change his life? Like he never would have guessed. I mean, that guy does things today that my wife and I couldn't get him to do in 33 years. Why? He fell in love. When you fall in love with Jesus, you can't help but fall in love with this church. And if you say, I love Jesus, but I don't care for the church, you better examine your relationship with Jesus. It is his church, and he's the manager of the church. By the way, church, don't ever forget that. Don't ever forget that. that he gives us his power to do his work. I spent 15 years of my life in the mountains of eastern Kentucky and West Virginia. I love mountain people. Now, I love flatland people, too. That's, that's who I am. But I fell in love with mountain people. And I discovered an unusual sense of humor. Mountain folks like to laugh. And they especially like to laugh at themselves. And one of the stories there in Whitney County where I served for all those years is the story of a super-duper vacuum cleaner salesman who came to sell his vacuum cleaners there at our holler. Do you know what a holler is? If you don't, God bless you. Came to sell his vacuum cleaners there in one of the hollers, and, and he knocked on the door, and the lady came to the door. He said, ma'am, I'd like to show you the world's best vacuum cleaner. She said, I'm not interested in buying a vacuum cleaner. He said, ma'am, I didn't ask you whether you were interested in buying a vacuum cleaner or not. I'd just like you to see the world's best vacuum cleaner in operation. Wouldn't it be okay if I showed it to you? She said, well, I suppose so. Well, he went in the house, had the vacuum cleaner in one hand, brown paper bag in the other, brown paper bag in the other. He said, ma'am, regardless of what I do, I don't want you to get excited. He said, I've got everything under control. And he turned the brown paper bag upside down, poured out dirt on the floor. He said, ma'am, don't get excited. If my vacuum cleaner won't clean it up, I'll lick it up. She said, you might as well get to it. We ain't got no electricity. <laughs> now, folks, about the time we think the church is ours and not Jesus's, we find the power's been unplugged. It is his church, therefore the church will not, cannot, ever fail. His church and the preaching of his word through his church, he's the manager of it. That's why, you know, I would have messed up churches a long time ago if it had been up to me and my power. You would have messed up churches, including this one, but it's Jesus' church. The third thing I would point out is the church is right in its message. Notice what Jesus said. Jesus said, Upon this rock I will build my church, and I will give unto you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatsoever you shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever you shall loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. That's a strange statement, isn't it? What in the world did Jesus mean? I give unto you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. I got some keys in my pocket today. What's the purpose of a key? When's the last time you went to a party and you walked around and said, have you seen my beautiful key? Isn't that the most beautiful key you've ever seen in your life? Now, don't do that. The folks in the white coat will come after you. A key is not for its beauty, is it? What's the purpose of a key? Tell me, what's the purpose of a key? I'm not going to drink you. What's the purpose of a key? Opens the door, right? Right? Jesus said, I give you that which opens the door to heaven. Now, what if you don't use a key? That happens to be a key to our house, Bowling Green. What if I went home this afternoon and we sat in the car and said, I'm not going to use the key or remote or whatever we got. But anyway, I'm not going to use the key. What happens? This door stays closed, right? When he says, I give to you the keys to the kingdom of heaven, He's giving to us the gospel message of Jesus, which I've been trying to preach to you this morning, and which we must tell to everybody in Princeton and Caldwell County that Jesus, the Savior, came into the world for you and me. And Jesus, born in purity, lived the perfect life, never said the wrong thing, thought the wrong thing, or did the wrong thing. He went about doing good, 
He performed miracles, but he didn't come primarily to perform miracles. He came primarily to die for you and me and them. And when we tell the story of Jesus, and the Holy Spirit does his work, and a person, man, woman, boy, or girl, turns from sin to trust Jesus, the gate to heaven opens wide. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Now, are folks going to hear that message at Walmart tomorrow? Probably not, unless we take it there. Are they going to hear it where you work? Probably not, unless you take it there. Now, everybody is not going to use the key. But when we share the message, the gospel message, the story of Jesus, and somebody believes on Jesus, the key works every time. And the door to heaven opens wide for that person. Now, that's what I'm asking you to do this morning. You've not yet trusted Jesus? You say, Brother Don, look at all these people. I'm up here in the balcony. I don't know that I can get down here. Or I'm back here in the crowd. All these people. Now let me tell you something I know. I told you a minute ago, this is not perfect people. But they'll be pulling for you and praying for you as you walk down the aisle, as you step out of the balcony, wherever you come from. They'll be pulling for you. If we weren't so sophisticated, when you started down the aisle, they'd probably stand up and say, go, go, go. We're pulling for you. And nobody's going to embarrass you. We're not going to confuse you. I'll meet you right here. And together, if you want to, if you've already prayed to trust Jesus, that'd be wonderful. We'll talk about that. But if you've not yet prayed to trust Jesus, I'll lead you in prayer. We'll pray together. You can walk out of this building today, August the 1st, 2021, for the first, first time in your life, knowing that you're on your way toward heaven. You say, Brother Don, I'm saved. I'm a church member. My membership somewhere else, but uh, I, I've begun to attend Southside Baptist Church, maybe only a few times or maybe a bunch, but I've begun to attend Southside Baptist Church. And, and I believe this is where God wants my church membership to be. Well, hey, if I lived in Princeton or this area, I'd join Southside Baptist Church. But I want you to follow the leadership of the Lord. And if the Lord wants you here, these folks will welcome you with open arms and join with them in serving Jesus and doing the good work of the gospel right here, right now, to use the key to heaven and share it as often as we can. You come and join this morning. Whatever you need to do, you make your way forward. We're not going to embarrass you or confuse you or anything of that sort. We'll help you. Now, Dane's going to come and lead us, and we're going to sing something. I'm not sure what, but whatever it is, it'll be a good one. But it doesn't matter whether it's a good one or not. It's a good one for you. It's a good one for you to make your decision for Jesus and to do it today. You know, I've noticed through the years Brother Cody, that the best time for people to come forward is when we stand together to sing. Because the physical is showing the spiritual, so just let the momentum of your standing help you. And folks, between you and the aisle, they'll move out of your way. And before you know it, you'll be down here. You come right on and make that decision I've talked about. Do it quickly, do it quickly. Right now, let's stand together. Come right on. Are you hurting and broken within? Are you hurting and broken within? Overwhelmed.